I am Bonnie Gilman, founder of the Grandparent Autism Network. The Grandparent Autism Network is a volunteer-based 501c3 nonprofit organization that informs grandparents about autism and the medical, educational, legal, and social issues that affect their families. We serve grandparents and their families in 34 cities in Orange County, California. This website extends our support effort to grandparents worldwide by offering resources and suggestions that address our shared concerns and commitment to make things better for our families. The Board of Directors and I are pleased to bring this website and video presentation to you cost-free. GAN relies entirely on public support for funding. If this information is helpful to you and you are benefiting from our efforts, we would appreciate your contributions for our educational outreach. All donations to the Grandparent Autism Network are tax deductible and can be made safely on this website. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. So thank you very much for the invitation to Orange County. And I hope that today is going to be uh, a very exciting day in terms of presenting uh, some of the research that's going on into autism, dispelling some of the myths about autism, and establishing some of the facts. And I also hope that uh, as part of today, you get to see that you have uh, local talented scientists here in Orange County and that uh, there may be an opportunity to establish an autism research center right here. So my presentation is going to be looking at uh, a range of research that we've been conducting into autism. I'm going to start just by acknowledging that the research I'm going to present is the result of collaboration uh, it couldn't be done by any single individual, and that's part of the message of why you need a center, that you need collaboration between scientists working at very different levels. This first slide uh, has, um, has many names. I'm not going to go through each of them, but they fall into two groups. Um, the first group of scientists are psychologists and those using neuroimaging or brain scanning to look directly at brain function and brain structure so that we can understand the differences between people with autism and people without autism. The second group that you can see on this slide uh, are scientists looking at the role of hormones because part of our research in England is trying to understand why autism affects boys much more often than girls and we've been targeting the male hormone, testosterone, to try and understand if this plays a role in the development of this condition. But let's just start right at the beginning to uh, remind ourselves what autism is. Today we think of autism as part of a spectrum. That's to say it varies in terms of severity and uh, we also recognize that there are different subgroups. So that's the notion of a, of a spectrum. At the top of this slide, you can see the two main areas of behavior that go towards the diagnosis of autism. So the first is very familiar to all of you, social and communication difficulties. That really lies at the heart of autism. The second is narrow interests, sometimes called obsessions, where the child becomes completely fixated on one topic and wants to do the same thing over and over again. And very repetitive uh, love of routines. So those are the diagnostic features. And many of you have a child with autism or uh, have somebody in your family with autism. And it's those features that will have contributed to the diagnosis. Now, I mentioned that there are different subgroups. And um, to be uh, very uh, simplistic about it, we can really say that there are two main subgroups. In fact, research 
uh, recognizes several others, but there are really just two main subgroups that we need to think about. The first is classic autism, uh, and the second is Asperger's syndrome. So what you can see here is that uh, classic autism affects boys much more than girls, and in, um, in, in this slide you can see it's four males for every one female. Asperger's syndrome uh, also affects boys more than girls, nine boys for every one girl. So the question that has been driving us as scientists is to try and understand what it is about being male that increases your risk of obtaining a diagnosis of autism. The other thing to, uh, to, to bring out is the differences between these two subgroups. They both share the same diagnostic features that you see at the top of the slide. The communication and social difficulties, and the narrow interests and obsessions. But how they differ uh, is in terms of the associated uh, other difficulties. So in classic autism, the child also has learning difficulties, that's to say below average IQ, and the child was also late to talk. So whereas a typical child is uh, producing single words by two years old, in the case of classic autism, they're not yet producing speech by two years old. Whereas in Asperger's syndrome, there are no additional learning difficulties, that's to say the child has an IQ in the average range or even above average, and they talked on time. If you go back into the developmental history to ask when did the child start to talk, they spoke on time. So that's the main, those are the main differences between these two subgroups. But the challenge for research is to understand how they are linked. So let's um, talk a little bit about, um, about some facts to do with autism, because the spirit at the theme of this, of this meeting is facts and fiction. The first fact I want to bring out is that autism is no longer rare. Whereas in the old days, it was thought to be very rare. For example, in the 1970s, if you picked up any textbook about autism, the figure that was quoted was four in 10,000 children. Today, we believe it's 1% of children, one in 100 children will have a diagnosis on the autistic spectrum. So that big change in prevalence, in how common it is, is probably mostly due to better recognition, better services, as well as broadening the diagnostic criteria to include Asperger's syndrome. The second uh, fact that is worth highlighting is that autism, uh, autism spectrum is no longer necessarily commonly associated with learning difficulties. So whereas in the old days it was said that three quarters of children with autism had below average IQ. Today, it may even be the reverse, that uh, three quarters of children with autism have normal IQ, so they're in that high functioning subgroup, um, but we really don't know the exact figures, and that's why there's a, a great need for more research to understand the profile of the population. The other thing to highlight in terms of facts is that autism is different to many other disabilities because it doesn't just involve areas of difficulty, it also involves areas of strength. So whereas we think of many disorders as, being, uh, as, as leading uh, in a very straightforward way to a pattern of difficulties, what we'll see during my lecture is that autism is a mixed picture of both strengths and difficulties. And part of the message for educators is to uh, consider how we can work with the strengths in order to uh, overcome the difficulties. Some more facts before I get into the specifics of our research. And that is that we now recognize autism is neurological. So it really is the result of atypical brain development. 
And it's important to underline this because in the bad old days, parents often felt to blame for their child's behavior as if they had done something wrong in not bringing up their child in the correct way. Whereas we now recognize that autism is the result of atypical brain development. We know this uh, for many reasons, and on this slide you can just see three examples of atypical brain development.